In this presentation, we will start our study of the book of Revelation, which is the last book in the New Testament, and this presentation will cover chapters 1 through 5. So let's start by way of introduction. The book of Revelation encourages followers of Jesus Christ to remain faithful in the midst of persecution and trials. This book is also known as the Apocalypse, which in Greek means a revelation, uncovering or unveiling of that which is hidden, as the revelation of Jesus Christ. This book is both an unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ and an uncovering of Jesus Christ's authority and power and his role in the Father's plan of salvation. The book also reveals much important information about the events leading up to the second coming and the millennium. Prayerful study of this book can bring you a deeper understanding of the resurrected and glorified Son of God and his dealings with God's children throughout the ages of earth's history, particularly in the last days. The prophet Joseph Smith said, quote, The book of Revelation is one of the plainest books God has ever caused to be written. End of quote. Though it is rich with imagery and symbolism that are not always easy for readers of modern times to understand, the themes of the book are simple and inspiring. The message of the Revelation is the same as that with all scripture. There will be an eventual triumph on this earth of God over the devil, a preeminent victory of good over evil, of the saints over their persecutors, of the kingdom of God over the kingdom of men and Satan. Thus, the book of Revelation extends a message of hope to all the faithful. Revelation was written at a time when Christians were facing false teachings, apathy, and severe persecution. Most likely, this persecution came at the hands of Roman officials in the latter years of the reign of Dom Domitian. Um, and I, if I've, I'm saying his name right, Domination revived the practice of emperor worship and exiled or executed those who did not worship gods approved by the state. Ancient sources indicate that Christians and Jews were persecuted under his reign. John wrote from the Isle of Patmos where, according to tradition, he had been exiled by Roman officials for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. John wrote a message of hope and encouragement to those in his day who still adhere to the teachings of Jesus Christ. The faithful members of the church lived in times of intense persecution with all the apostles gone except John, who was now in exile, and with many factors and problems in the church. As a result, the saints were in great need of the encouraging message found in Revelation. John reassured them that God was in control, Jesus Christ's ultimate triumph over evil would be complete, and the hope of hopes of all Christians would ultimately be realized. John wrote about the things which he had seen, the visions of Jesus Christ, the things which are, and things which shall be. The book of Revelation, understood with the aid of Latter-day Revelation, presents an inspiring overview of the history of the world concentrating particularly on the time preceding the second coming of Jesus Christ and the great millennial era of peace. The book contains promises to faithful saints who overcome evil. It contains numerous symbolic images, including dragons and beasts. It contains one of the few scriptural passages describing the pre-mortal war in heaven. Its major themes include Jesus Christ's role in carrying out God's plan, the hand of God in earth's history, the second coming of Jesus Christ and the destruction of evil, the spiritual protection promised to the righteous in the latter days of the millennium, and the promises that the earth will eventually become celestial. John's revelation show not only that the Almighty knew the end from the beginning and contemplated the whole of earth's history, but also that he arraigned it. To say it more strongly, before the first soul was ever placed on earth, God orchestrated the whole of earthly existence. God knows how each person will behave at any given time under any given circumstance. Isn't that amazing? We have lived with him for so long that he, he, he knows us that intimately. By knowing what each person will do, he knows how the whole of any combinations of people will behave. He shapes history by assembling the aggregate while at the same time allowing each individual free reign over his own destiny. 
Let's now go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1, 1, phrase, unto his servants. This revelation was given to the saints, to the servants of God, to those who have the gift of the Holy Ghost, and who thereby have the gift spirit of understanding and interpretation. It was given to those whose knowledge of what is involved is not limited to the cold words of the Bible, and these are and shall remain the only people who can understand its doctrine, comprehend its symbolism, and gain from it the mysteries of the kingdom of God, which God hath reserved for those who fear him, who honor him, and who serve him in righteousness and in truth all their things. The phrase, things which must shortly come to pass, meaning this is one of the great keys which opens the door to an understanding of the book of Revelation. What is recorded therein is to transpire in the future, mainly in a day subsequent to New Testament times. The revelations promised are to come to the saints of latter days, not to those in the meridian of time. All the promised events will transpire shortly. They are soon to be in the perspective of him who one day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Joseph Smith said, quote, The things which John saw had no allusion to the scenes of the days of Adam, Enoch, Abraham, or Jesus Christ, only so far as is plainly represented by John and clearly set forth by him. John saw that only which was lying in fortuity and was shortly to come to pass, end of quote. Also, John had the curtains of heaven withdrawn and by vision looked through the dark vistas of future ages and contemplated events that should transpire throughout every subsequent period of time until the final winding up scene. Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, the book of Revelation is an unveiling. The Joseph Smith translation changes 1-1 one, one to clarify that the book was re indeed a revelation given to John by the Savior Jesus Christ. The Joseph Smith translation reads, The revelation of John, a servant of God, and was given unto him of Jesus Christ. Gerald Enlund, who later became a member of the Seventy, explained that the book of Revelation unveils many truths. The title of the book is, in Greek is Apocalypsis, from which we get its other common name, the Apocalypse. Apocalypsis is from two Greek words, apo, a preposition denoting separation or removal, and kaili pato, pato, a verb meaning to cover, hide, or veil. Apocalypsis then literally means removal of the veil or covering, hence its title in English, the book of Revelation, or the uncovering or unveiling. While we might find the title to be ironic, arguing that few books are more hidden or veiled, it is an appropriate one, for it has truly truly reveals many things. Elder Busson McConkery in response to the question, are we expected to understand the book of Revelation answered? Certainly, whilst did the Lord reveal it? The common notion that it deals with beasts, plagues, and mysteries, symbolisms that cannot be understood is not true. If we apply ourselves to the full purpose of heart, we can catch the vision of what the ancient revelator recorded. If we diligently use the keys the Lord has given us to interpret the book of Revelation, it can truly become a book of Revelation for us. End of Brother Lund. Revelation 1 1 states that the revelation from God was signified by an angel unto his servant John. The word signified is the English translation of the Greek word asimanin which can mean to indicate something by a sign, mark, or token. Revelation 1-3, the phrase, Blessed is he that. The book of Revelation contains several blessed is statements. These are similar to the Beatitudes found in Matthew 3, 5, 3-11. The progression of ancient 
I'm sorry, the progression of actions described in Revelations 1-3, read, hear, and keep, show that besides reading or hearing the book of Revelation or any other book of Scripture, we must also keep those things which are written therein. By doing all these things, we receive the promised blessings. The Joseph Smith translation of verse 3 adds the word understand to this sequence, showing the importance of understanding the teachings of this book. To understand doesn't mean just intellectually in your mind. Understand means that it gets to the heart and will become converted to it. Revelation 1.3 includes the phrase, for the time is at hand. The Joseph Smith translation of verse 3 clarifies this concept. It says, for the time of the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. When John said that he was shown things which must shortly come to pass, the second coming was one of those things he referred to. As with all things, the second coming will occur in accordance with the Lord's timetable. Remember, one day to him is a thousand years to us. Revelation 1, 4 through 20, Symbols. Symbols are powerful teaching tools because they can communicate to people in different generations and cultures. They can communicate multiple messages. God often uses symbols to teach eternal truths, including truths about his beloved son. To understand symbols, the following guidelines may be helpful. 1. Study the scriptures to determine if other passages provide an interpretation or insight. 2. Examine the context in which the symbols are used. 3. Consider the nature and characteristics of the symbols. And 4. Use the study aids in the scriptures. And 5. Most important, seek personal revelation from God. The following chart summarizes prominent symbols found in Revelation 1 and some possible interpretations. Verse 4, the symbol is seven spirits. Possible interpretation is servants or leaders over the seven churches in Asia. And that comes from Joseph Smith's translation of Revelation 1.4. Verse 6, the symbol is kings and priests. Possible interpretation, those who receive exaltation in the celestial kingdom. Section 76, 50 and 56 through 57. Verse 8, the symbol Alpha and Omega, meaning first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, representing Christ's eternal role in God's work. Revelation 1, 4 in the Bible Dictionary under Alpha. Verse 12, seven candlesticks, symbol in interpretation, the seven churches that are to hold up the light of the gospel. Reference, Revelation 120 and 35, 18 through 24. The verses 16 through 17 as a symbol of the right hand. Possible interpretation is covenant hand and symbolism of Christ, uh, a symbol of power. Christ holds the seven churches in his right hand. That right hand is the covenant hand. So Christ is under covenant to, to uphold his church. It comes from Psalms 110.1, Mark 16.19, Acts 7-55. through 55. Verse 16 is seven stars. The interpretation, another image representing the, the servants or leaders over the seven churches. Revelation 120 and the Joseph Smith translation of 120 footnote B. Verse 16, the symbol of sharp two-edged sword, meaning the word of God, pronouncing judgment on the wicked and freeing the innocent. Hebrews 4.12 and DNC 6.2. And then verse 18, the symbol keys of hell and of death, meaning keys that unlock the doors of overcome spiritual and physical death. 2 Nephi 9.10-13. Revelation 1 4, the seven churches in Asia. Special instructions are to be forthcoming for seven congregations situated in Asia. Whether these were branches, ward stakes, or simply the total body, body of the saints in the named localities, we have no way of knowing. Nor, for that matter, do we know the precise organizational arrangement prevailing in that day. Suffice it to say that John, as one holding the keys of the kingdom on earth, had jurisdiction over the whole body of the church and was properly chosen by a deity to convey his message to his people. The Joseph Smith translation of chapter 1 verse 4 the seven, is that the seven servants over the seven churches.
not the seven spirits, the Lord's message to all his saints, and particularly to those whom he has called to preside over the various congregations, for they are responsible for the spiritual well-being of those placed in their charge. Revelation 1, 5, the phrase washed us from our sins in his blood, meaning the blood of Christ alone cleanses repentant souls from sin. No one thing can enter into the kingdom of God are the words of Christ, the first begotten from the dead, and none shall gain inheritance there, save it be those who have washed their garments in my blood because of their faith and the repentance of all their sins and their faithfulness unto the end. Revelation 1, 5 through 6, kings and priests unto God. Revelation 1, 5 through 6 shows that the blessings of being made kings and priests unto God come through applying the atonement of Jesus Christ in our lives. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught the following about the phrase, washed us from our sins in his own blood, quote, the blood of Christ alone cleanses repentant souls from sin. No unclean thing can enter into the kingdom of God are the words of Christ, the first begotten from the dead, and none shall gain an inheritance therein, save it be those who have washed their garments in my blood because of their faith and the repentance of all their sins and their faithfulness unto the end. This is Third Nephi twenty seven nineteen, which just above was quoted. President Joseph F. Smith taught the object of our earthly existence is that we may have a fullness of joy and that we may become the sons and daughters of God in the fullest sense of the word, being heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. To be kings and priests unto God, to inherit glory, dominion, exaltation, thrones, and every power and attribute developed and possessed by our Heavenly Father. This is the object of our being on this earth. In order to attain unto this exalted position, it is necessary that we go through this mortal experience or probation by which we may prove ourselves worthy through the aid of our elder brother, Jesus. End of quote. The prophet Joseph Smith quoted Revelation 1.6 and focused on the phrase, hath made us kings and priests unto God and, the, and his Father, giving this explanation of its meaning. God the Father of Jesus Christ had a father. Paul said that which is earthly is in the likeness of that which is heavenly. Hence, if Jesus had a father, can we not believe that he had a father also? The prophet Joseph Smith earlier taught, quote, God himself was once as we are now and as an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens, end of quote. Revelation 1, 5 through 7, Jesus Christ will come with ten thousands of his saints. The message of the Joseph Smith translation of Revelation 1, 1, or Revelation 1, 5 through 7, conveys comfort and hope. These verses describe the Savior's second coming. Quoting now the Joseph Smith translation of 1, 5-7, Therefore I, John, the faithful witness, bear record of the things which were delivered me of the angel, and from Jesus Christ, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kingdoms of the earth. For behold, he cometh in the clouds with ten thousands of his saints in the kingdom, clothed with the glory of his Father. And every eye shall see him, and they who pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. These teachings help us understand that many faithful saints who died at the hands of persecutors did not die in vain, and will be rewarded for their righteousness. Revelation 1, 6, phrase, unto God and his Father. In one of the crowning sermons of his ministry, delivered June 16, 1844, just 11 days before his martyrdom, the prophet Joseph Smith read as a text Revelation 1, 6, and announced, quote, It is altogether correct in the translation. Then he proceeded with great power to consider the subject of a plurality of gods. He quoted a number of biblical passages and used his text verses used these, these text verses to show there was a God above the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, All the faithful saints shall come to dwell in unity and in all the glory and everlasting burnings of the gods, when they shall see as we are seen and be as our God and he as his, his 
as his father. I want to reason a little on the subject. I learned it by translating the papyrus, which is now in my house. I learned a testimony concerning Abraham, and he reasoned concerning the God of heaven. In order to do that, said he, suppose we have two facts, that suppose another fact may exist. Two men on earth, one wiser than the other, would logically show that another is wiser than the wisest may exist. Intelligence exists one above another, so that there is no end to them. If Abraham reasoned thus, if Jesus Christ was the Son of God and, God and John discovered that God the Father of Jesus Christ had a father, you may suppose that he had a father also. Where was there ever a son without a father? And where was there ever a father without first being a son? Whenever did a tree or anything spring into existence without a progenitor? And everything comes in this way. Paul says that which is earthly is in that in the likeness of that which is heavenly. Hence, if Jesus had a father, can we not believe that he had a father also? I despise the idea of being scared to death of such a doctrine, for the Bible is full of it. I want you to pay particular attention to what I am saying. Jesus said that the father wrought precisely in the same way as his father had done before him. As the father had done before he laid down his life and took it up the same as his father had done before. He did as he was sent to lay down his life and take it up again, and then was committed unto him the keys. I know it is good reasoning. End of Joseph Smith's quote. Jo uh, Joseph Smith's translation of Revelation 1-7, the phrase, He cometh in the clouds. As he went up, so shall he come. From the Mount of Olivet he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Acts 1, 9-12 And he shall come again in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And once again he shall stand upon the Mount Olivet. Revelation 1, verse 7 With ten thousands of his saints, our Lord ascended alone, but he shall return with the hosts of heaven. Chapter 1, verse 7, the phrase, Every eye shall see him. The incarnate God was born into the world, not in secret, but without the knowledge of his advent being known to men generally. But when he comes again, all men shall know. There will be no question about the transcendent events that are transpiring. Every eye shall see him personally. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the flesh shall see it together. Isaiah 45, 30, 40, verse 5. I will gather all nations and tongues, he says, and they shall come and see my glory. Isaiah 66, verse 18, and Isaiah 52, 10, and D&C 133, 3. Chapter 1, verse 7, the phrase, they also which pierced him. Quoting D&C 45, 51 through 52, and then shall the Jews look upon me and say, what are the wounds in thine hands and in thy feet? Then shall they know that I am the Lord. For I will say unto them, These wounds are the wounds which I was wounded in the house of my friends. I am he who was lifted up. I am Jesus that was crucified. I am the Son of God. Chapter 1, verse 7, The phrase, All kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. When our Lord returns, there shall be among the wicked and ungodly such welling and mourning as never before been known on earth. For the summer will be over, the harvest past, and their souls not saved. Revelation 1, 8 and verse 11, Alpha and Omega. As the Jeffrey R. Hall and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles while serving as dean at Brigham Young University explained the meaning of Alpha and Omega as name titles of the Savior. Quote, nothing is so pervasive in our lives, nothing so encompassing and enfolding and upholding as the Savior of this world and the Redeemer of all men. Alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, suggests commencement and inception. I was in the beginning with the Father, he reveals. And as the firstborn, he stood at the right hand of the Father in the councils of heaven and in the work of creation. It was by our unity with him, as he was one with the Father, that we survived a great conflict between good and evil before this world was created. 
By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony, we overcame the opposition of Satan, that old serpent called the devil. As he was in the beginning, so he will he will be so will he be when this world ends. As Omega, a name taken from the last of the Greek alphabet, Christ is the terminus, the end cause as well as the end result of our mortal existence. These letters from the Greek suggest the universal role of Jesus from the beginning of the world to its end. But he ought to be Alpha and Omega in the particular as well, our personal beginning and our individual end. End of Elder Holland's quote. Revelation 1.8, the Almighty. The Almighty is the English translation of the Greek word pantor creator, which suggests one who rules and regulates all things. One theme of the book of Revelation is that even though God's people in all ages face persecution and trouble, God does indeed govern all things and will one day put an end to all evil. Several images from the first chapters of Revelation reinforce the Savior role as the Almighty. His word is represented as a sharp two-edged sword. He holds the keys of death, of hell and of death, and he knows people's works. Revelation 1 verse 10, the phrase, the Lord's day. Pursuant to the divine command, men were to rest from all temporal work and to worship the Lord one in particular one day in particular each week. This day, no matter which day of the week is involved, is called the Sabbath from the Hebrew Sabbath, meaning day of rest. The rest, though important, is incidental to the true keeping of the Sabbath. What is more important is that the Sabbath is a holy day, a day of worship, one in which men turn their whole souls to the Lord, renew their covenants with Him, and feed their souls upon the things of the Spirit. From the days of the early apostles to the present, the Sabbath has been the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, in commemoration of the fact that Christ came forth from the grave on Sunday, Acts 27. The Latter-day Saints keep the first day of the week as their Sabbath, not in imitation of what the peoples of the past have done, but because the Lord so commanded them by direct revelation. Chapter 1, verse 10, the phrase was in the Spirit. John was in the Spirit when he received this revelation. Just like Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon were also in the Spirit when there was opened up to them a transcript from the records of the eternal worlds, that is, Doctrine Covenant 76. If we too want revelation, we must take the time and make the effort to be in the Spirit. Some of us too often dismiss the possibility out of hand. We must feel, as did Laman and Lamiel, that the Lord maketh no such thing known unto us. But Nephi describes the Lord's promise that if you will not harden your hearts and ask me in faith, believing that you shall receive with diligence in keeping the commandments, surely these things shall be made known unto you. Revelation 111, the phrase, the first and the last. These terms are descriptive of his, our Lord's, eternal timelessness. He is God's everlasting. As the first, the thought is conveyed that he is preeminent above all earth's inhabitants, both from the standpoint of time, he being the firstborn of the spirit, and from the standpoint of power and dominion, he having becoming a God in the beginning. As the last, the concept is revealed that he will go on as God, continuing to enjoy his full preeminence to all eternity, everlastingly, without end. Chapter 1, verse 11, the seven churches the Lord reveals through our mind according to our experiences. Though these specific churches and 24 elders were just a small part of God's work on earth, they were foremost in John's mind. They were representative of all of us. The Lord has revealed what I say unto one, I say unto all. The seven churches of Asia were representatives or types of the whole church, seven being symbolic of completeness, entirety. Seven is used 40, 54 times in Revelation. Seven churches, candlesticks, stars, angels, vials, thunders, heads on the beasts, kings, mountains, and 1,000 year periods. Chapter 1, verse 12, to see the voice phrase. How do you see a voice? The figure of speech here is called catachoresis or incongruity by another figure called metonymy. The voice stands for the person and we see the person. 
Chapter 1, verse 12 and 20, seven golden candlesticks, meaning the imagery of the seven golden candlesticks, recalls the seven-branch menorah found in the Jerusalem temple. These candlesticks represented the seven churches. They were established to give light to the world, just as the Savior had commanded his disciples to do so. Candlesticks carry light. They do not create it. Their function is to make it available, not to bring it into being. So, by using seven candlesticks to portray the seven churches to whom John is now giving counsel, the Lord is showing that his congregations on earth are to carry his light to the world. Christ is the light of the world. Uphold your light that it may shine unto the world. Behold, I am the light which ye should uphold, that which ye have seen me do. 3 Nephi 18, 24. So was it also in ancient Israel, when Moses made a candlestick of pure gold, which held seven candles for the use in the tabernacle, and then later the temple. Chapter 1, verse 13, the phrase, One like unto the Son of Man. John is receiving instruction from an angel upon whom the Lord has placed his name, and who therefore speaks and acts in first person as though he were the Lord, so that his words, acts, and appearance are those of the Lord. Verse 13, the phrase, the Savior is in our midst. In John's vision, he saw Jesus Christ in the midst of the seven candlesticks, showing symbolically that he was with or among the seven ancient churches. During his mortal ministry, Jesus promised, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there, are I, there am I in the midst of them. The assurance that Jesus Christ is with his saints and watches over them is also found in modern scripture, such as Doctrine and Covenants section 38 verse 7 which says verily verily i say unto you that mine eyes are upon you i am in your midst and ye cannot see me such assurances have also been reiterated by modern prophets and apostles president henry b iron of the first president he testified that the lord watches with us he who sees all things whose love is endless and who never sleeps he watches with us end of quote isn't that a comforting thought? Christ constantly watches with us and over us. Chapter 1, verse 13, the phrase, the Son of Man. Christ is the Son of Man, meaning that his Father, the eternal God, is a holy man. In the language of Adam, man of holiness is the name of God, and the name of his only begotten is the Son of Man, even Jesus Christ, a righteous judge who shall come in the meridian of time. Thus, Christ is the Son of Man of holiness, or more briefly put, the Son of Man. Accordingly, when he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He was conveying precisely the same thought, as he would have done by saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of God, am? For that God, who is the Father, is a holy man. Chapter uh, Verse 13, the phrase, A garment, a golden girdle, is referring to robes of the holy priesthood, even as it had been with Aaron and others when they ministered in their lesser priestly offices. Chapter 1, verses 14 through 15, it is not easy to describe God. In fact, Joseph Smith said, His brightness and glory defy all description. Joel, these are two... There are two other rec recorded accounts of our Lord's appearance and like glory to men on earth. One before his mortal birth was to Moses and Aaron, Nahab, and Abihu, and seventy elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, paved work of sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in its clearness. The other, after his resurrection and ascension to eternal power, was to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery in the Kirtland Temple. We saw the Lord stand upon the breastwork of the pulpit before us, they testified, and under his feet was a paved work of pure gold and color like amber. His eyes were a flame of fire, his hair of his head was white like pure snow, his countenance shone above the brightness of the sun, and his voice was the sound of rushing of great waters, even the voice of Jehovah, saying, I am the first and the last, I am he who liveth, I am he who is slain, I am your advocate with the Father. Doctrine and Covenants 110, 2 through 4. Chapter 1, verses 16 and 20, Who are the seven angels of the seven churches? 
that Joseph Smith translation changes the word angels to servants in Revelation 120, see footnote B. And in the opening verse of each of the seven letters to the churches in Asia. Thus, the seven stars representing the presiding officers who were then leading the seven churches. Verse 116, in his right hand, seven stars, meaning the presiding offices, officers of the seven congregations who, as with all ministers, are in the hands of the Lord. They do not speak or act of themselves. They represent their master, whose words they speak, whose acts they perform, and in fact, whose they are. Verse 16, the phrase, out of his mouth, when a sharp two-edged sword, meaning one side would be hurtful to the wicked, cunning them to the very center, 1 Nephi 16.2, and the other side would be helpful to the righteous, piercing their hearts and causing them to burn with the Spirit, 3 Nephi 11.3. 1 Nephi 1.16, the phrase, and his countenance was as the sun. There is no way to comprehend or describe the brightness and glory of, exalt of exalted personages. I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head above the brightness of the sun, the prophet Joseph of his first vision said of his first vision. And when the light rested upon me, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description. In his journal, Joseph first wrote that I saw fire exactly over my head, but struck out the word fire and wrote pillar of light. Evidently, the brightness was so intense that Joseph thought the grove was on fire. Chapter 1, verse 18, the phrase, the keys of death and hell. Death is the separation of the body and spirit, the body returning to the death from whence it was taken, and the spirit entering the spirit world to wait the day of the resurrection. Hell is that part of the spirit world where the wicked go to suffer the torments of the damned until they come forth to be assigned their place in the kingdoms they are prepared. Keys are the controlling power. Our Lord therefore governs death and hell. All men live and die at his will. They are cast down to hell or saved therefrom by his decree. All men are in his hands forever. He is supreme because he holds the keys. Chapter 1, verse 20. Angels are servants. See Joseph Smith Translation 120 footnote B. In Hebrew and Greek, angels are messengers. And these servants of the seven churches were leaders or messengers of their respective unit, units of the church before the Lord. Candlesticks or menorahs representing the seven church units were put in place to give light to the world. We now go to Revelations chapters 2 and 3. Revelations 2 and 3, a pattern in the letters to the seven churches. The following gives an overview of the pattern used to address the seven churches. See the map for the location of the churches below. Each letter first addresses the leader of the church in the area and uses symbolic terms to identify Jesus Christ. It next conveys the Lord's words of praise and commendation of his words and his words of correction and warning. Then promises are given to those who overcome through faith in Jesus Christ. These promises are related to exaltation and eternal life and they contain rich temple symbolism. What John writes concerning these churches are also prophetic of and apply to today. So we're going to start with Revelation chapter 2, 1 through 7. This is to the church in Ephesus. Remember what is said to these churches, you will see, also is happening and is applying and God is speaking to us today. Chapter 2, verse 1, the description of the Savior. The Savior is in the midst and in complete complete control of his work. Verses 2 through 3, their situation. The Savior knows their trials of apostasy, patience, and faithfulness. Verses 4 through 6, warning and rebuke. Return to the Savior. Some will teach that sensual pleasure outside of marriage is acceptable. The Nick Nicolaitanians' beliefs included sexual perversions, members who were trying to maintain gospel standards while also continuing to live after the manner of the world. 
Can you see how what they were doing then applies today? We have the same thing happening today. There are members of the church who try to be members of the church but keep one foot in the world and try to do both. And the Savior rebukes the members back then for that, and he's rebuking us today for trying to do that. Verse 7, the conditional blessing is those who overcome the world will be permitted to partake of the tree of life, which we know is the love of God, which is the atonement of Jesus Christ and the fruits of the atonement. Revelation 2, 8 through 11, the church in Smyrna. Chapter 2, verse 8, description of the Savior. The Savior has all knowledge, the first and last, power and life. Verse 9, their situation. The Savior knows our tribulations, poverty, and persecutions. Verse 10, the warning he gives. We will be tried completely. Ten days, ten in Hebrew, is symbolic of completeness. And fear them not. Verses 10 through 11, conditional blessing is, if faithful and overcome, will receive a crown and avoid the second death, which is spiritual death, which is separation from God. Revelation 2, 12 through 17, to the churches in Pergamos. The description of the Savior in verse 12, the words of God cut to the heart and pierce the soul. He hath the sharp sword with two edges. Verse 13, their situation. They live in a time of Satan's power, and some will hold fast to Christ's name. Verse 14 through 16, the warning he gives. The plaguing sin of Israel in all its forms will be sexual immorality. The doctrine of Baal and the Nicolaitans, which is the doctrine of Baal and the Nicolaitans, repent quickly or I will come and fight against thee with the sword of my mouth, meaning God's word. President Ezra Taft Benson said, quote, The plaguing sin of this generation is sexual immorality. This, the prophet Joseph, prophet Joseph said, would be the source of more temptation, more buffeting, and more difficulty for the elders of Israel than any other. End of quote. Again, President Benson said, Do not be misled by Satan's lies. There is no lasting happiness in immor immorality. There is no joy to be found in breaking the law of chastity. Just the opposite is true. There may be momentary pleasure. For a time it may seem like wonderful. everything is wonderful, but quickly the relationship will sour. Guilt and shame set in. We become fearful that our sins will be discovered. We must sneak and hide, lie and cheat. Love begins to die. Bitterness, joy, anger, and even hate begin to grow. All of these are the natural result of sin and transgression. On the other hand, when we obey the law of chastity and keep ourselves morally clean, we will experience the blessings of increased love and peace, greater trust and respect for our marital partners, deeper commitment to each other, and therefore a deep and significant sense of joy and happiness. End of quote. Chapter 2, verse 17, the conditional blessings were hidden manna, meaning the eternal life, and a white stone, meaning a Urim and Thummim, see DNC 130.10 through 11, and a new name will be given to the faithful. Revelation 2, 18 through 27 is to the church and Thyatria. Chapter 2, verse 18, the scripture of the Savior is, the Savior is the perfect, pure judge whose soul and life was tried in the furnace of affliction. Verse 19, their situation was, the Savior knows each of us and our humble efforts of service, charity, patience, and faith. Verses 20 through 24, the warning he gives is, there will be apostates who seek to destroy God's kingdom through false teachings and demands of change in the church to society's acceptance of sinful behavior as normal. We see that today with homosexuality with transvestism or trans, transvestites um, transgenderism that those in the church want the church to make those things in society normal chapter 2 verse 25 
and verse 28 and the Joseph Smith translation of 2627, the conditional blessings are hold fast, overcome, receive the fullness of the priesthood to rule in righteousness over many kingdoms and given the morning star, which is Christ. Revelation 3, verses 1 through 6, is the church in Sar Sardis. 3, verse 1, the scripture of the Savior is, He that hath the seven servants of God and the seven stars. Chapter 3, verse 2 through 4, their situation was, they needed to be watchful, hold fast, and repent. In the midst of the whole of abominations, there are those who have not defiled themselves, their garments, and walked with God in white. So there were at least some being faithful. Verses 2 through 4, the warning was, Be watchful and strengthen one another and hold fast. The Savior will come in an hour we know not. Verses 5 through 6, the conditional blessings were, We will be clothed in righteousness with our names written in the book of life, meaning being in exaltation. Revelation 3, 7 through 13, to the church in Philadelphia. Verse 7, the description of the Savior. He has the key to open or shut the way to, exalt, to celestial glory and exaltation. The key of David, which is the absolute power resident in Christ, whereby his will is expressed in all things, both temporal and spiritual. Verses 8 through 10, their situation. There will be members who have kept the Savior's word and not deny his name because they have kept the word of his patience. And those who profess to be members, but it is a lie because of the desire of their hearts. So we see the same today. Those who are true members, even in their heights, hearts were those who profess to be members, but in their hearts they do not follow him. Verses 9 through 10, the warning, those who profess membership but are not in their hearts will experience the judgments of the world. Verses 11 through 12, the conditional blessings are hold fast and overcome the world and you will receive all that God has and is. God will write them upon his name, the name of New Jerusalem, and given a new name. Revelation 3, 14 through 21, to the church in Laodicean, chapter 3, verse 14, description of the Savior. The Savior is our true, firm, and faithful advocate in whom there is no deviation. Verses 15 through 17, their situation. Some in the kingdom will be lukewarm in their commitment to the Savior because of their prosperity, which keeps them from seeing the wretched state we are all in without Christ. President Gordon B. Hinckley taught that since the church is either true or it is false, one cannot logically adopt a lukewarm position towards it. The book of Revelation declares, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Each of us has to face the matter. Either the church is true or it is a fraud. There is no middle ground. It is the church and kingdom of God or it is nothing. End of President Hinckley's quote. Verses 17 through 19 in chapter 3, the warning he gives his lukewarm commitment to God will cause him to spew them out of his mouth. I must be willing to be tried and chastened by fire to have the shame of my nakedness covered by being clothed in white robes, garments of the holy priesthood, through sanctification so that I may see by the Holy Ghost. 20 through, verses 20 through 21, the blessings conditional blessings, I will have the privilege of being invited by the Savior, enabling me to sit with him on his throne. We now go to Revelation chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1, the phrase, a door was opened in heaven, means the heavens were opened. John on earth was permitted to gaze into heaven. Verse 1, the phrase, of vo the first voice which I heard, the voice of the angel upon whom the Lord had placed his own name, and who was thus commanded to speak in first person as though he were the Son of God himself. Revelation 4, 1, the phrase, these things must be hereafter. Gerald Enlund, Gerald Enlund, who later served as a member of the 70, 
gave an overview of John's vision in Revelations 4 through 22 and explained some of their basic meanings. The basic structure of the vision is chronological. After seeing the Father and the Son in heaven, the vision of the history and the destiny of the world began to unfold to John. He sees the first five seals or the first 5,000 years of history in rapid fire in encapsulated form. Then he sees the opening of the sixth seal, which includes the restoration of the gospel. After that, John sees the seventh, seventh period of a 1,000 years with great judgments poured out upon the earth, including Armageddon, which eventually led to the utter overthrow of Babylon and make way for the second coming of him who is King of King and Lord of Lords. Immediately following that, John sees Satan bound and Christ reigning for a thousand years, a last great battle between the forces of righteousness of evil and the final judgment. Finally, a new heaven and a new earth are brought forth. End of Elderland's quote. Revelations 4 to a rainbow about the throne, meaning encircling the throne. The author, flying above clouds and stores, has seen in the midst of clouds below a rainbow forming a perfect circle. Of the vision of God, which he saw, Ezekiel wrote, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so the appearance of the brightness round about it, that was the appearance of likeness of the glory of God. So one of the symbolism of the rainbow is the glory of the Lord. In seeking to describe the splendor of a similar scene, the prophet Joel Smith said, The heavens were opened upon us, and I beheld the celestial kingdom of God, and the glory of thereof, where then the body or out I cannot tell. I saw the transcendent beauty of the gate through which the heirs of that kingdom will enter, which was likened to circling flames of fire, also the blazing throne of God, upon which was seated the Father and the Son. I saw the beautiful street of that kingdom, which had the appearance of being paved with gold. End of quote. The rainbow was also the token of the covenant Jehovah made with Noah that he would not flood the earth again. The Joseph Smith translation of Genesis chapter 9, verse 11, see footnote C, says this, And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there be any more a flood to destroy the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you, which I made unto Enoch, concerning the remnants of your posterity. And then in the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 9, verses 21 through 25 states, And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant which I made unto thy father Eni, that when men should keep all my commandments, Zion shall again come to the earth, the city of Eni, which I have caught up unto myself, and this is mine everlasting covenant, that when the posterity shall embrace the truth and look upward, then shall Zion look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy. And the general assembly of the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven and possess the earth, and shall have place until the end come. And this is mine everlasting covenant which I made with my father Enoch. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will establish my covenant unto thee which I have made between me and thee. For every living creature of all flesh that shall be upon the earth, and God said unto all, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and thee for all flesh that shall be upon the earth. So one of the things we should do, brothers and sisters, is if we see a bow in the sky, we should start thinking about our covenants. The rainbow was symbolic of the covenants of God, of the everlasting covenants we receive in baptism and in the temple, and especially of eternal marriage. And so when you see a rainbow, we should think about how well am I keeping my covenants? How am I doing? The rainbow is to remind us of the covenant. Isn't it interesting that the Satan has taken this same symbol and changed it into something perverse? That the rainbow is representative of pride and homosexuality and sin. Interesting how Satan has done that. 
Thus, when we see a rainbow, we are to think upon the covenant God has made with his children that Zion will once again come upon the earth, and how are we in keeping our covenant in God? Revelation 4, 4, 20, 4 and 20 elders. In section 77, 5, there was a question asked, what are we to understand by the 4 and 20 elders spoken by John? Answer, we are to understand these elders whom John saw were elders who had been faithful in the work of the ministry and were dead, who belonged to the seven churches and were there in the paradise of God. Thus John has seen what is to be in the future. He has seen certain elders in celestial splendor who at that time were in their disembodied state in paradise awaiting the day of their resurrection and the receipt of eternal life. In principle, it is the same as when Joseph Smith, on January 21st, 1836, saw his father and mother, who were then still living in mortality, in the celestial kingdom of heaven. It is, worth of, worth, it is worthy of note that these exalted persons who are sitting with God on his throne are elders, not seventies, not high priests, not patriarchs, not apostles, but elders, than which there is no more important priest in God's earthly kingdom. Indeed, every elder who magnifies his calling as an elder has the immutable promise of the Father, guaranteed by his personal oath that he shall gain all that the Father hath, which is eternal life, which is Godhood, which is to sit with him on his throne. White raiment and crowns of gold represent their exalted condition, celestial glory. And women who respect and use the blessings of the priesthood will receive of the same. A possible reason for the number 24 is that in ancient Israel, the priesthood was divided up into 24 courses, or possibly what we would say quorums. Thus, 24 represented all of the priesthood, showing that in order to gain exaltation, one needed to be a faithful elder in the Melchizedek priesthood who magnified his calling on earth. Revelation 4, 5, the phrase, out of the throne preceded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. How can mortal prophets find language to unveil to the view of their fellow mortals the splendor and transcendent beauty of that eternal world of celestial might and glory? They speak of rainbows, of jewels, of circle of flames, of fire, of burning coals of fire, of lightning flashing forth therefrom. They tell of thunders and voices, of the sound of rushing of mighty waters, and of majestic displays of might and beauty, all in an attempt to record in mortal words that which can be seen and known only by the power of the Spirit. But the Lord be praised that they have made such an attempt so that those who have not seen and heard may gain some meager knowledge of those things hidden behind the windows of heaven. The Joel Smith translation of chapter 4, verse 5, the seven servants of God, the presiding officers of each of the seven churches in Asia to whom the council in chapters 3 and 4 was directed would in due course, for the vision is of the future, join the celestial host in glorious exaltation. The seven servants each had a lamp and menorah of burning, fire burning before the throne, represented that they had the fire of the Holy Ghost, which 3 Nephi 19.13 says, And it came to pass, when they were all baptized, they had come up out of the water, and the Holy Ghost had fallen upon them, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Revelation 4.6, the sea of glass. The sea of glass mentioned in Revelation 4.6 represents the earth in its sanctified, immortal, and eternal state. See Doc and Covenant 77.1 and DNC 136-9. Revelations 4, verse 6, the phrase, four beasts. Again, in section 77, verse 2 through 3, we have the question, what are we to understand by the four beasts spoken of in the same verse? Answer, they are figurative expressions used by the revelator John in describing heaven, the paradise of God, the happiness of man and of beast, and of creeping things and the fowls of the air, that which is spiritual being in the likeness of that which is temporal, and that which is temporal being in the likeness of that which is spiritual, the spirit of man in the likeness of his person, as also the spirit of the beast and every other creature which God has created. 
Question, are the four beasts limited to individual beasts, or do they represent classes or orders? Answer, they are limited to four individual beasts, which were shown to John to represent the glory of the classes of beings in their destined order or sphere of creation in the enjoyment of their eternal felicity. In a great sermon about the resurrection and salvation of all forms of life, the prophet Joseph Smith expanded upon the inspired words from section 77, saying, among other things, quote, When God made use of the figure of a beast and visions to the prophets, he did it to re represent those kingdoms which had degenerated and become corrupt, savage, and beast-like in their dispositions, even the degenerate kingdoms of the wicked world. But he never made use of the figure of a beast or any of the brute kind to represent his kingdom. Then he referred to a statement made by Daniel. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. Continuing his own explanation, the prophet said, quoting, The angels interpreted the vision of Daniel, but we find by the interpretation that the figures of beasts had no allusion to the kingdom of God. You will see that the beasts are spoken of to represent the kingdoms of the world. There is a grand difference and distinction between the visions and figures spoken by ancient prophets and those spoken of in the revelations of John. I am now going to take exceptions to the present translation of the Bible in relation to these matters. Our latitude and longitude can be determined in the original Hebrew with far greater accuracy than in the English. There is a grand distinction between the actual meaning of the prophets and the present translation. The prophets do not declare that they saw a beast or beast, but they saw the image or figure of a beast. Daniel did not see an actual bear or lion, but the images or figures of those beasts. The translation should have rendered image instead of beast in every instance where beasts are mentioned by the prophets. But John saw the actual beast in heaven, showing to John that beasts did actually exist there and did not represent figures of things on earth. When the prophet speaks of seeing beasts in their visions, they mean that they saw the images, they being types to represent certain things. At the same time, they received the interpretation as to what those image or types were destined to represent. End of quote. In the writings of our prophets, beasts are usually types representing such things as kingdoms, as already mentioned, and as in Revelation 13. But here in Revelation 4, the beasts are beasts, that is, celestialized animals. In addition, the prophet Joseph Smith taught the four beasts were four of the most noble animals that had filled the measure of their creation and had been saved from other worlds because they were perfect. They were angel-like in their sphere. We are not told where they came from. So there's two ways beasts were being used. Some of the prophets used beasts to represent the kingdoms of the earth, the, the image of a beast, meaning the kingdom, kingdoms of the world, the governments of the world. John, however, is seeing actual four animals that in the celestial kingdom, there will be animals that are exalted also. Revelation 4, 6, full of eyes beforehand, and Revelation 4, 8, the four beasts each had wings. Doctrine and Covenants 77, verse 4 tells us, What are we to understand by the eyes and wings which the beasts had? Answer, their eyes are a representation of light and knowledge. That is, they are full of knowledge. And their wings are a representation of power to move and act. Similar descriptions of the eyes and wings of beasts in heaven were given by Isaiah and Ezekiel. Isaiah 6, 2 through 3, and Ezekiel 1, 8, and then 10, 12. Revelation 4, 8 through 11, the phrase, Worship him that liveth forever and ever. The various heavenly beings that John saw were all worshiping the Father. One of the truths taught in Revelation 4 is that exalted beings will continue to worship Heavenly Father in the eternities to come. He will always be our God. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, stated, We will go on praising the Lord forever and ever. We will never need to be coaxed. End 
of quote. Revelation 4.11, why should all created things, whether men or beasts, give glory and honor to God? Joseph Smith said, quote, everlasting covenant was made between three personages before the organization of this earth, and it relates to their dispensation of things to men on earth. These three personages, according to Abraham's record, are called God the first, the creator, God the second, the redeemer, and God third, the witness or testator. Accordingly, we here find the four beasts and the four and twenty elders given glory to honor t- and honor to the Father because he created them. Were it not for him, they would not be. And in Revelations 5, 8 through 14, we shall find these same creatures coupled with an innumerable host of others giving glory to the Son because he redeemed them. And were it not for the redemption, the whole purpose of creation would have faded away into nothingness. There would be neither immora- immora- <laughs> sorry, immortality nor eternal life. On the same basis, we should rejoice in the mission of the Holy Ghost, the mission of revealing to men the truths of salvation, of sanctifying their souls when they conform to the revealed word, for without such revelation and sanctification, power there could be of no salvation. End of quote. Chapter 4, verse 11, the phrase, For thy pleasure they are and were created. The creative enterprise of deity are past, present, future. They go on everlastingly. But why? What is the purpose of creation? Speaking of man, or the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the air, and in fine, all things which are created, Lehi said, There is a God, and he hath created all things, both the heavens and the earth, and all things that in them are, both things to act and things to be acted upon, and bring about his eternal purposes in the end of man. That is the purpose of creation, is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. To say nothing of the salvation of worlds without number and of all created things that are, that on them are. Revelation 5, 1 through 14. But in its fullest signification, the purpose of creation is enable men to gain eternal life so that they being thus glorified and having gained for themselves eternal kingdoms patterned after the kingdom of their eternal father may present their kingdoms to him so that he may obtain kingdom upon kingdom and it will be exalted and it will exalt him in glory. Revelations chapter 5. 5 Chapter 5, verse 1, the book with seven seals. As John's vision continued, he saw a book written within on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Doctrine and Covenant 77, 6-7 contains an explanation of the book with seven seals. The first seal contains the first things of the first thousand years, and the second of the second thousand years, and so on, until the seventh. Revelations 2, 4, a strong angel. This is chapter 5, 2, 4, strong angel. Meaning, as with men, so with angels, some are greater than others. There is rank and precedence, and there are varying degrees of power and might among God's ministers. The angel asks, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? But no creature being, but, but no created being is fit to receive so high a commission. So high a mission, and John weeps, fearing lest the promises of Revelation 4 1 should fail. Revelation 5 5, the lion, the tribe of Judah. Christ is the lion, the tribe of Judah. He is the only unworthy and powerful enough to open the seals. When Father Jacob gave Judah his patriarchal blessing, Judah was likened both to a lion's whelp and to an old lion and was promised that the scepter should not depart from his descendants until the coming of Christ. According to, accordingly, to denominate our Lord as the lion of the tribe of Judah is to point to his position as a descendant of Judah, to his membership in that tribe from which kings were chosen to reign, and also to show his status as the most preeminent of all that house, as the one who bore the banner of the tribe, so to speak. Both of these phrases are titles of Jesus Christ. Lion of the tribe of Judah is a fitting title because a lion is majestic and powerful, and because the Savior was born through the lineage of Judah. 
The title line of Judah is a stark contrast to the meek and sacrificial lamb mentioned in verse 6. These two images convey that Christ possesses both majesty and meekness. The phrase, the root of David, is Christ is the root of David. This designation signifies that he who was the son of David was also before David, was preeminent above him, and was the root or source from which the great king in Israel gained his kingdom and power. A root provides life-saving water and nourishment to a plant. Such was the mission of Jesus Christ to all who accept him as their Savior and Redeemer. Revelation 5, 6, the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God is a title of Jesus Christ. The Lamb that John bo saw bore the marks of one who had been slain, evoking images of Christ's sacrificial death by crucifixion. The book of Revelation refers to Christ as a Lamb nearly 30 times. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained the significance of this name title. Quote, from Adam to the atonement of Christ, men were commanded to offer the firstlings of their flocks, that purest lamb without spot or blemish, as a similitude of the sacrifice that God the Father would make of his firstborn, his only begotten Son, whom lived with perfection in the midst of imperfection. End of quote. Not only were the people of Israel referred to as sheep, but Jesus himself was seen as a sheep led to the slaughter. He was also deemed a young and tender sheep or lamb, Paul calling him our Passover, who was sacrificed over, referring to the sacrificial lamb at Passover. Joseph Smith translation of Revelation 5, 6, the phrase 12 horns, 12 eyes, 12 servants. Clearly the allusion here is to the 12 apostles of the Lamb who are sent forth into all the world as special witnesses of his name and as the chief administrator of his earthly kingdom. John described the Lamb in his vision as having many horns and eyes. In the scriptures, horns are often a symbol of power. Eyes often symbol light and knowledge. The Joseph Smith translation of Revelation 5 says, the Re Revelation 5 verse 6 indicates that the Lamb had 12 horns and 12 eyes, which are the 12 servants of God. See Revelation 5 6 footnote B. Since the Lord's people in ancient Israel were numbered as 12 tribes, and the Lord organized his church with 12 apostles, the number 12 can symbolize divine government, organization, or priesthood. Isn't that interesting in contrast to a beast as described to earthly governments and organizations? This verse may suggest that all priesthood power and knowledge is centered in the Lamb of God. Revelation 5-7, only Christ had the power to put into effect all the terms and conditions of the Father's plan. He was the only one to open the seal. In other words, to instigate the plan of salvation. Christ could make an infinite atonement, which is the heart of the great plan and the central operation in the history of the earth's salvation. Revelation 5.8, fell down before the Lamb. 5.12, worthy as the Lamb. And 5.13, him that sit upon the throne unto the Lamb. And 5.14, worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. All of those have the same similar theme, meaning... True saints worship the Father in the name of the Son by the power of the Spirit. The Father is the object and center of all true devotions. It is to Him that we pray. It is He. It is not only our. He is not only our God, but the God of the Son, and will be so forever. And yet there are no words to describe, no language to use, no rhetoric to employ, which can. Begin to praise the glory of the Son for all that he has done. The words here sung by the myriads and myriads who praise his holy name perhaps come close as anything in holy writ. Of him whom the Father hath anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows, the command is, He is thy Lord, and worship thou him. Psalms 45, 7-11 
Perhaps Nephi stated the same truth as succinctly and persuasively as it has ever been done in these words, Believe in Christ and deny him not, and Christ is the Holy One in Israel, wherefore ye must bow down before him and worship him with all your mind, mind and strength and your whole soul. And if ye do this, ye shall in no wise be cast out. Second Nephi 25.29 Chapter 5, verse 8, the phrase, vials full of odors, represents the prayers of the saints. Revelations 5, 9 through 10, kings and priests. Revelations 5, 9 through 10 declares that through the worthiness and redeeming blood of Christ, all people may be redeemed and crowned with glory to reign on the glorified earth as kings and priests or queens and priestesses. After quoting these verses, Elder Bruce R. McConkie, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained that temple ordinances anticipate the fulfillment of these blessings. Quote, Before the time when Christ saw him personally upon the earth, the elect of God among every kindred, having first believed the restored gospel, will go to the temples of God and receive the ordinances of exaltation, whereby they qualify to become kings and priests, or queens and priestesses. End of quote. That queens and priestesses was not part of the quote. I added that. Revelation 5.13, every creature which is in heaven. In addition to the teachings and Doctrine and Covenants, section 77.3, the prophet Joseph Smith taught the following about the destiny of all God's creations. Quote, I suppose John saw beings there of a thousand forms that had been saved from 10,000 times 10,000 earths like this. Strange beasts of which we have no conception, all might have been seen in heaven. John learned that God glorified himself by saving all that his hands had made, whether beasts, fowls, fishes, or men, and he will glorify himself with them. Says one, I cannot believe in the salvation of beasts. Any man who would tell you that this could not be would tell you that the revelations are not true. John heard the words of the beast giving glory and understood them. End of quote. I hope this has helped with some of the symbolism in the book of Revelation of the grandeur of God the Father and Jesus Christ and the blessings that we can attain through salvation. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button.